it's my pleasure. I'm Abby Wolf, and I'm the executive director here. <coughs> we know what that means. Um, and it's a pleasure to welcome you all here. I think many of you were here last night and have seen the exhibition. Maybe some of you saw it during the day today. And I suspect that after this conversation, we are all going to want to go back numerous times and revisit the work. Um, but I'm here to thank the, thank the Hip Hop Archive for hosting us, thank Ruth Fine for curating the show, and to introduce Frank Stewart and Fred Moten, our distinguished guests. Um, I'll start with Professor Moten. Uh, Fred Moten is professor in the Department of Performance Studies at, the, Studies at the Tisch School of the Arts at NYU. He holds an AB from Harvard and a PhD from the from University of California, Berkeley. Moten teaches courses and conducts research in black studies, performance studies, poetics, and critical theory. He's the author of several books, including In the Break, The Aesthetics of the Black Radical Tradition, and a three-volume collection of essays whose general title is Consent Not to Be a Single Being. That was published in 2017 and 18, and there are many other books that I'm not naming, but a lot. Um, prior to joining the NYU faculty in 2017, Moten served on the faculties of the University of Iowa, the University of California at Santa Barbara, UC Irvine, and, US, and University of Southern California. He was also the inaugural Helen L. Bevington Professor of Modern Poetry at Duke and Distinguished Professor of English at UC Riverside. He, he has served on numerous boards and editorial boards and is the recipient of numerous awards and fellowships, including the Guggenheim. In 2014, his, the Field Trio was a poetry finalist for the National Book Award, the Los Angeles Times Book Prize, and was winner of the California Book Award. And in 2016, his The Little Edges was a finalist for the Kingsley, Tuft, Kingsley Tufts Poetry Award. Now on to Frank Stewart. Frank Stewart is senior staff photographer for Jazz at Lincoln Center, a position he has held since 1992. In the course of his long career, he has produced defining portraits of jazz's great artists, bringing us closer to the music and the process. Many of these we see next door. His interest in music began in his home environment, introduced by his mother and her family to blues, gospel, and jazz. His stepfather, the jazz pianist Phineas Newborn Jr., was instrumental, I'm sorry to say instrumental, to his, <laughs> to his becoming deeply involved with jazz and jazz performance. His early mentors were phot photographers Roy DeCarava and Gary Winogrand and painter Jack Whitten. In 1994, he published Sweet Sing Blues on the Road, drawn from his travels with the Wynton Marsalis Septet from 1989 to 92. Though we're focused on his jazz work today and in the Cooper Gallery, he is also a dedicated chronicler of people and places outside of jazz and in Africa, Cuba, and throughout the United States. In Aperture's Vision and Justice issue, Wynton Marsalis wrote of Frank Stewart, as dreams of previous generations erode, there is nothing more uplifting than the clear vision of a veteran free of bitterness. That's why I love the work of Frank Stewart. His vigilant eye is trained on counter-narrative realities that run deeper than race, gender, class, or even oppression itself. Frank loves black folks, but he focuses on timeless human, human fundamentals that only increase in value and intensity with time. He is a jazz man with a camera improvisational, empathetic, and accurate. All kinds of folks trust him and let him in. And without further ado, welcome to Frank Stewart and Fred Moten. Wow, that's great. Thank you very much, and it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm happy to see everybody. And it's uh, definitely an honor for me to be here with Frank. It's my, and, um, it's my honor to be here with you. <laughs> well, they, they, um, the advertiser, there's a conversation, but I'm, I'm really thinking of it more as an interview. I'm just as interested in, in listening to Frank as, as I know you all are and hearing him talk about his work. So, so that's what we're going to do. <laughs> um, I, um, there's so many places to start, but maybe we should start with the start. You know, how did you get started as a photographer? So, 
first we have to deal with the backdrop that created who I am. Okay. So, and that's the, the segregated South and the segregated North. You know, I, like I grew up in Memphis, Tennessee, where you grew up in Arkansas, mm -hmm. so you know all about it. And uh, there was music all the time. You yeah. know, uh, back in the day, you couldn't put on BET or anything to see music. You had to put on the radio, and the radio was on all, all the time. You know, on Sunday it was gospel. The weekdays it was rhythm and blues. And at night it was blues. Mm -hmm. You know, WDIA and in Chicago it was WVON. Mm -hmm. So um, that kind of set the tone for how we view the culture. That was like the, the top of the culture, you know. That's the stuff that everybody saw every, all the time. That's the stuff that everybody uh, heard every, all the time. So they didn't know we could take pictures or paint mm -hmm. or write. That didn't get out like, like, like the music did. Yeah. Um, so growing up in the South, you know, it was a, a culture that fed on itself. Mm -hmm. It was insular and it was uh, segregated. So you couldn't go out to the suburbs and live in the suburbs. All the professional, all the uh, doctors and lawyers live right next to the people that had to go pick cotton every day. Mm -hmm. So uh, the culture kind of fed off itself like that. If you can well, add some things to this. <laughs> no, I'm just, it's funny because um, my my family, my mom's family was from a small town in southeast Arkansas called Kingsland, Arkansas. And I don't remember, I grew up in Las Vegas, but but I always tell people that, Las, that the part of Las Vegas that I grew up in was a kind of, was a village, a transplanted village from Arkansas. Um, it, it reminds me very much of a great essay by Toni Morrison called City Limits, Village Values, the way that um, those sort of values and, 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 and cultural mores and folk ways were transplanted as people moved either up north at that part of the Great Migration or out west like, like my family did. And I'm, it's funny, we often think about, you know, Highway 61 as a blues highway as it goes up through the Mississippi Delta but then goes through Memphis to Chicago. and um, and that's, that's a pathway you took, too. That is a pathway I took. Uh, also, you know, growing up in the South, there was like, uh, if you had one drop of black blood, you were black in the South. The white people, if you had one blood, uh, drop of white blood, you weren't just white. Everybody was white that was white. <laughs> yeah. So the black people had a caste system. The white people didn't have that for us. We made that ourselves, you know. There was a thing called the Brown Bag Society, where your skin color had to match a brown bag or a lighter mm -hmm. to be accepted in certain places. But uh, the whole thing about being together in the South is that you had people in the 50s that were like, 20 years outside of the Great Depression. So nobody really had any money unless mm -hmm. you were a doctor, a lawyer, or something like that. Mm -hmm. So everybody was together. Everybody went to school together, light skin, black skin, you know, the whole thing. And that's part of uh, the backdrop of the culture, too. Yeah. It's, you talked about, there's that, there's this kind of amazing, I don't know if it's a, gift or a problem that a kind of emerges in black culture. I remember it was a great essay uh, by Amir Baraka called The Myth of a Negro Literature. Mm -hmm. He's basically making the argument that only in ra the rarest of occasions, and this is in the early 60s, has, has Afro-American literature achieved anything like the, the richness and the depth of, 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 of black music. Even contemporary artists today, like Arthur J. Fool, will basically say the same thing. He, he aspires in his work as a cinematographer and as a filmmaker to achieve the richness and depth, and he, he uses the term alienation of, of black music. 
So when you were talking about your origins as a photographer, you immediately started start talking about turning on the radio, right? So how is it, how can we talk about how black photography, does it emerge from the music? Is it attempting to capture the music? Is it reporting on the music? Is it trying to make music itself? What's that relationship between photography and music in, in black art? The thing about black photography is we've had black photographers all the way from 1837 on up, mm -hmm. you know, so it wasn't, it wasn't like we just came to the, the table uh, in the 1900s, you know. Mm -hmm. We were there from the beginning. Jules Lyons was right there with uh, the cat that started the Garotax, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. and Fox Talbot. Uh, and he went to New Orleans. So when the first uh, jazz musicians came on the scene, you know, the photography was very stiff. Mm -hmm. In 1900, they had to take people outside, and you know, they would be. <laughs> you know. So as the as the uh, as the medium progressed in technology, so did the look of jazz too. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they didn't photograph too many Negroes at the time prodded us black photographers to start shooting music ourselves. Mm -hmm. And since, it's, since it was everywhere, you know, that's where we were, minstrels at the time, uh, it was willing subjects mm -hmm. all the time. When I first got to New York, that was in the 50s. And you could go see anybody. You know, mm -hmm. you could go photograph anybody. The only guys that were photographing was Herman Leonard and, and William Gottlieb. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't until Chuck Stewart came along uh, that you really got a concentration of black photographers like Roy DeGrava and Hugh Bell. Mm -hmm. That was along the same time with Chuck Stewart. So uh, those are my mentors too. I mean, I'm standing on the shoulders of those guys too. Yeah. There's a, I was reading today in the New Yorker, this kind of great essay by Hilton Alls on, oh, on Roy DeGrava, yeah. And he, uh, they're, they're redoing a show that I guess they did at the Whitney 20 years ago, maybe more, called The Sound I Saw. Yeah, that first, that first uh, was premiered at the Studio Museum. Okay, okay. And of course, your, your show is The Soul, The Sound of My Soul. So how do we think, can we say something about the relationship between soul and scene? And how sound <coughs> mediates that relationship, or if it does? Well, the thing about Roy is that, you know, when I saw the Sweet Fly Paper of Life, <coughs> I, had to, uh, I had to come and study with him. Yeah. And I was in Chicago at the time. So that was the first time I had seen a black photographer treat the black image with so much empathy and, and love, mm -hmm. for lack of a better word, uh, that I had to come here and study with him. And that's what I did. I came to study with him. And... Since when, when he was growing up, jazz was the popular music. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he, he focused on the guys that were around him. Mm -hmm. And I was coming up in Chicago, and we did the same thing. So in addition to photographing the people on the streets and everything, we also chronicled the music. Mm -hmm. And that's how a few phot photographers got into shooting jazz. Yeah. It's I don't like, know if that answered that soul question. Well, but there's some, I, I don't know if what I'm asking is a, tech, is a real technical question or more of a kind of spiritual question. Well, I think the soul is there anyway. Yeah. You know, that's, that's inherent mm -hmm. in our work and in the music. So not only that, if you come out of the South, the church, you know, all of this stuff comes out of the black church mm -hmm. back in the day. So you already have it. You just have to tap into it. Yeah. How do you tap into it? Like, literally, how, as a photographer, I, I imagine that there are, there are, I know some, actually, I have two of them at home, my sons. They love music, and I believe that they love black people. And there's some technical aspects to playing music that they just haven't quite mastered yet that, that would allow them to express that love in their playing. You mean they're, they're musicians? Yeah. 
Yeah, okay. You see, but you see what I'm saying? Like, what wh are there? What are those techniques? Are they techniques? Is it a matter of experience? Is it a matter of continuing to practice and continuing to fail? How do you? I mean, some, how do you do it? Some of it is technical. Yeah. But you know, they say I was talking to. Uh, few jazz musicians that come from the South, and they say, you can't teach the blues. Mm -hmm. you know? Either you come from it, or you have it, and you let it out. Some things you can't teach. Mogu Miller was saying that. You know, he was saying, this is the stuff you can't teach. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he came from Mississippi, I think, yeah. and Tennessee, and Memphis. So some things you just can't teach. They have to get it themselves some kind of way. Yeah. You got to have the blues to play the blues, right? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, don't know. The, the greatest ones had it, right? Billy Holiday, all those great blues singers had it. You know, they had the blues. I'm interested and, in know, the people who it, have the blues who can't play the blues. <laughs> yeah, right. right. Like, That's probably I've had it, it, but I can't play it. But the, and so I, I'm trying to understand what the difference is between, I would love to play it. The you thing know. about 99.9% <laughs> of all the people who have the blues cannot play the blues. Yeah. <laughs> but the thing about being black in America is you automatically got the blues. Mm -hmm. But, but what, what's the difference between those of us who can't play it and those of us who can? What's the difference between those of us who can somehow show it or express it or reflect it in our artworks or in our writing or in our photography and those of us who can't quite do it, try as we might. That might be a technical problem. That might be a, a practice problem. <laughs> it might be a scale problem. You, know? you might not be proficient enough on your instrument to, to uh, express yourself the way you want to. That's all. So how did you... You talked about, in the, this great interview, you talked about that moment at the March on Washington when you saw those pictures and you immediately realized, you said something like, I, I found out that I could fail right away rather than have to work for something, work on something for a week and then find out I failed. Oh, yeah. that, the, thing that. About, the thing about taking pictures is I was a painter before and mm -hmm. you know I would be painting for, I would be painting on a canvas for three days and you know, after the third day, it would be a monstrosity. <laughs> <laughs> so with a camera, I had 36 exposures. I could, you know, I could shoot 36 exposures and mm -hmm. get them right back and see I had 36 failures right away. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I would have a good one. Is that opportunity to fail right away? But that also that opportunity to continue to practice within the context of that failure? Is, is, that, is that another way to describe improvisation? Well, the thing, about, the thing about failure is you learn from failure. You don't learn from winning. You, know? you don't learn from the, from the winners. You learn from the failures more than you learn from the successes. Yeah. So that's, that's what that 36 exposures were about. I had 36 chances to learn from those failures. Yeah. So one of the things I'm also thinking about is um, the diff the relationship between or is there a relationship between your your work or your your life as an athlete and photography not just the fact that having a scholarship in Middle Tennessee State allowed you to have contact with those with the ph photographers at Fisk but is there something about moving in that way about running about playing football yeah, basketball yeah, yeah. The thing about sports is it's, it's always uh, a struggle with, with your inner self, you know, to bring out the most talent you have mm -hmm. some kind of way. If either you practice hard or you, you play hard or whatever. The same thing about art. It's, it's a struggle within yourself because you bring to that subject matter all of your experiences in life. So it's very similar. You know, you can fail real good at sports. <laughs> <laughs> and you can fail real good in, in, in art. Yeah. Uh, I've been, I'm teaching this class, um, I, was, I was teaching it this morning, so I got here so late. And it's um, 
methods for, for performance studies for our PhD students in our department. And one of the things that we've been talking about the last couple of weeks is the difference between method and practice. Right? So we've been reading all this work on scientific method. Um, in particular, it's a great book by a philosopher of science named Feyerabend called Against Method. And he sort of initiated a movement in the philosophy of science that, that tries to, to valorize practice over method. Practice is this sort of continual movement along a way that tries to build up practical knowledge in relation to how to live rather than constantly constructing new objects of knowledge that are somehow detached from the actual practice of living. And it's, it, do you talk about your photography or think about your photography more in terms of practice as opposed to method? I mean, that's all it is, is practice. You yeah. know, you get out and you walk the streets every day and you're practicing your, your art form. You, you're practicing to learn how to see. Yeah. You know, it takes a long time to learn how to see like it takes a long time to learn how to play an instrument. Yeah. It's the same process. Mm -hmm. So, oh, yeah. I, I got fascinated a long time ago by, you know, I, obviously growing up listening to the music in, in the house, it, some, you know, similar to how you grew up, and really thinking hard about improvisation and what that is and what that means. And, um, and my favorite thing in the world right now is the online etymology dictionary. <laughs> so I just I can't stay off of it. But, but improvisation is this totally weird, kind of cool word, right? Because it, it, it's got the visual or visare seeing is embedded in it, but it's a negation of seeing. It's in pro visare to see, it's foresight to look ahead. So improvisation is usually understood as a kind of lack of foresight, a lack of planning, spur of the moment. Okay. And so for a long time, I felt like um, I, I was just talking um, a few couple months ago to a great trumpeter from Leland, Mississippi, not too far from Memphis, right on 61. Named Wadada Leo Smith. No, oh, I know Wadada from and, Chicago. He, yeah. he grew up in Chicago. Too. Well, he, that same track, that right, same road. Right, right, you right. Know? Um, and well, Donna told me he doesn't even like to use the word improvisation anymore. Like that same antipathy that a lot of musicians started to have to the word jazz, he's now got it to the word improvisation. improvisation. And I think it's because, you know, first of all, it's so rigidly opposed to composition, and it's so rigidly sort of seen as, again, a lack of foresight, just spur of the moment. It just comes out of you without practice, without, you know. And, um, and I just, but I was always so committed to the idea of improvisation and what people did with it and how, and how we lived with it and through it, you know, that I just like, how can you give it up? How can you give it up? And I've been working my way around. I'm, so what if it, well, go ahead, go ahead. Well, the thing about jazz, it, it, it's about improvisation. Yeah. You know, and what does it mean? It means you're trying to improve on what you just played, you know, yeah. the riff you just played. But you still have to know scales and whatnot to know how to play within that that genre. But if it's, but you just said something. That, this is the thing I've been thinking. You you immediately index it as much to what you just played as it is to what you're gonna play. Exactly, exactly. So if improvisation is on a on a purely etymological level, the lack of foresight, maybe it's because what improvisation really is all about at the end of the day is looking back. Right. It made me think, there's this famous essay that lots of folks who went to school the way I went to school, you know, are obsessed with uh, theses on the concept of history by this great philosopher named Walter Benjamin, and he talks about the angel of history looking back, right, moving forward into the future, but looking back into the past, right? And is that the way our, our culture moves to? Are we angels of history in that way? And the thing about jazz is we've had to come up with new things every 10 years, new movements every 10 years. I mean, unlike classical music, that came up with stuff every 100 years, mm -hmm. I mean, every 200 years, come up with movements. We've had to come up with movements every 10 years. We were, we were on, the, on the accelerated plan. We were on the accelerated <laughs> plan. And like, where is it now? You know, yeah. Is it new music? Is it just... 
no notes. All notes are strange notes now. But is it, is, I wonder if it's just that that accelerated movement forward is in a sort of weird way propelled by looking back, right? Like I'm thinking of that old song, you know, that I always remember Mahalia Jackson singing, but lots of people singing, you know, how I got over, my soul how looks back and it. wonders. Right, right. Is, is, is that, maybe, maybe that's the nature of our improvisation. It's not foresight because we're looking back. Right? We move forward, but we're looking back. We're trying to carry something with us, trying to bring something with us. Yeah. I mean, you, you're not repeating yourself. You know, <laughs> history doesn't, well, history does repeat itself, but yeah. you're looking forward to make something new all the time. Yeah. And that's what's happening in photography. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, what's the difference between shooting negative and shooting digital now? You know, before negatives, uh, low light, it was almost impossible to shoot in low light. Mm -hmm. Now you can shoot in any kind of light. Yeah. And so that changes the face of how jazz looks now. And I'm right there at the, at the looking back on black and white and going forward, as you say, in improvisation into digital photography. And that's kind of what the show is about, too. You know, you go from the 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s to now. So is it possible now? I'm thinking about that photograph, God's trombones. Is <laughs> we were it, just talking about that today. Is it, is, it, is it located in such a way that it's specific to a particular technique? Could, could it be made today? In the same way that at the moment when you did make it, does does well that's negative. That's a negative yeah. uh, color anyway. But um, how how would you make it today? How could could you make it today using digital techn oh, technology? Oh man, you know di digital photography has come a long way. Ten years ago, if you told me that there was never going to be any more uh, film cameras, man, you got to be crazy. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. Now you can't even find a film camera. <laughs> They don't sell them no more. They don't make them anymore. They almost stopped making film. They stopped making paper you can print on in the dark room. Mm -hmm. So it's changing, yeah. definitely. Well, so much of what we've been talking about so far is this real deep kind of, I don't know, synesthetic interplay between sound and sight. That, and and that's, culture. The, the, yeah. the culture drives it, you know? Well, a big part of the culture is food. And you, like, one of the things I like to think of about, you know, the, the book Smokestack Lightning, which is a kind of travel log through barbecue country, is mm -hmm. you're, the, you're the great photographer of, photographer of aroma. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I can smell barbecue when I look at those pictures. Well, you know, so how what, do you manage to do that? What makes the culture, what, um, what makes the culture, music, dance, uh, word, uh, language, and food, mm -hmm. you know? And we have it all. You know, African-American culture is so rich and full of all of that. And barbecue is, you know, at the top <laughs> of, the, of the food porn. <laughs> barbecue and gumbo. He does some mean barbecue, too. I don't know if you I, that. I've, I've, I've heard tell. I, <laughs> I haven't had a chance to test it yet. I don't, I'm wondering how come. You can, can, you can look at me and see that I will get to work. So I see you, I'll pull you, my weight. You, you, look like you, <laughs> you look like you know your way around. I do. Bone. I do. I do. So, but, uh, <laughs> and a good bow. Yeah. A good bow. Yeah. I'm thinking to, to just to, to, to pick up on that. It's, on the one hand, I hear everything you're saying and it sounds, you make it sound so easy to me in a way. You make it sound so natural at the same time as you're also telling us it requires practice. It requires technical proficiency. But there's this other way in which when I'm listening to you and you're just in this conversation, I'm, I'm struck by how miraculous it is that people figure out ways to portray a culture. Like, how is it 
that people figure out ways to infuse a work or a, in, a, in a series of works, how is it that they can infuse the entirety of a culture in all of the sensual registers in which it operates? How do you get that in a work of art? Like how? It's the, you know, when you see a uh, jazz musician like Coltrane and he's playing a long solo, Mm. And you say, wow, how does he come up with these notes? How does he know how to come up with these notes? I mean, he's doing it. He's practicing eight hours a day. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the same thing with photography. You know, you can go out and shoot four or five hours a day. You're still training yourself to do the same thing that Coltrane is doing. So, and all of your culture that's in you comes out mm -hmm. in that moment, just like a... Uh, Improvisation. Yeah, yeah. I'm learn. I'm trying to learn, not because I think I can ever do it, but because I'm trying to figure out something I can tell my students. I'm. I sometimes I get a little. I don't want to say scared, but a little nervous, because uh, it feels like maybe these capacities that we have to do impossible things are in danger. So I'm wondering, I'm, I'm, that's why I'm asking, that's why I'm asking the same question over and over again. It's because I want to, it's because I want to, I need to have something to tell my students. The thing time. about it is, like Bearden told me one time, it's uh, not what you're looking for, it's what you find. We're always looking for something, but we're not always finding what we're looking for. We're finding something else. Mm -hmm. I was reading this essay that uh, Hortense Spillers wrote commemorating the 25th anniversary of the publication of Harold Cruz's The Crisis of the Negro, Negro Intellectual. Intellectual. Yeah. And that, her essay was published in 1994. It's 25 years since then. Since then. Now. And um, actually, I was thinking about it because I, yeah, I have this fantasy to be a fly on the wall when you get together with Spillers and y'all start talking about Memphis, because she's from Memphis, too. Oh, I would love to meet her. <laughs> and, um, and I was reading one of the things that she, well, she's talking about a couple of things in the essay. One, what emerges as a function of the, what she calls the loss of the natal community. Um, and actually, I'm sitting here, you know, Professor West, I know you've written about this question. <laughs> You wrote a book about you know colored people, Professor Gates, and we all you got a series on have that. have a you got a series on colored people. <laughs> <laughs> I make a series every year about colored people. <laughs> <laughs> but but there's this this feeling that the kinds of communities that we grew up in that you talked about um, those kinds of tight knit um, communities in which class stratification hadn't separated the community out in that way, that those communities are, are gone in a way. Yeah, that's, that's, and, that's history now. Yeah, and, and so how do we, how do we, ex I, okay, I'm interrupting my own question with a story which hopefully will make the question more clear. I, we lost a great poet in New York um, the day before, uh, yesterday named Steve Dalachinsky. He was a kind of great poet and chronicler of the downtown New York jazz scene and the free jazz scene in particular. And um, he was a great poet and great person. You go to the Vision Festival or go to a uh, show at Roulette or a show at the Stone, he was always there. I don't know what it's going to be like now to go to a show and not have him be there. It's as, it's like, it's as if somebody from the band is missing. You know? <laughs> What's it going to be part. like? And it, and I began to think, you know, like how much more loss can the music stand? You know what I mean? Like how, again, and it's a question, he's a part of what you might call the natal community of that music as it emerged in the late 50s, early 60s downtown. So what I guess I'm, what, what's interesting, what the other thing that Spiller says in the, in the essay is that the problem is not only the loss of natal community, but the problem is also that we, a new generation of artists and scholars who are more concerned with what she calls personality than performance. Um, what do you think about that? <laughs> well, now it's a concept, you know. You <laughs> have to buy into the concept. 
Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's not art anymore. It's thinking about the concept of art. Yeah. So we're struggling right now, you know, in terms of our community. Yeah. You know, we don't have that community that we grew up in. Yeah. Where you had, you could look up to somebody, you know, oh man, he's a doctor. I want to be a doctor. Yeah. The yeah. doctors are gone. They're in the suburbs somewhere. Yeah. Lawyers. It wasn't just, it wasn't just the people that you could look up to, like doctors and lawyers. I remember the man, <laughs> man who used to mow my mother's lawn in Las Vegas, where it gets real hot, it was named Wilton Wesley. Great name. Great name. And he was a great figure. He um, was an alcoholic. No, he would not. walk the streets <laughs> in Vegas in July when it's 112 degrees. He called my mother. My mother was a school teacher. He called her Madam Professor. When Mr. And so what I just did was I, I caught myself saying this thing that I always used to say, but I'm, I wanted to point it out because it's not necessarily so natural. But I was going to say, but when Mr. Wilton came to our house, and that was the point. Like my mother insisted, like one time I think I accidentally slipped and called him Wilton. Oh, no way. And I got, I had to get chastised. And um, so... <laughs> What I'm saying is, is that the community included all those folks too. There was doctors and lawyers who you looked up to because they were leaders in our community. I'm thinking of Las Vegas, Dr. West, who was the head of the NAACP of our local chapter, people like that. But then there were also folks like Mr. Wilton who had his own special role and place in the community. He was funny. He, he said things that I still remember, right? He was our, he was like a troubadour walking the streets of the West Side in Las Vegas. The community included all those folks too. And, 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 and I wonder if we still maintain the capacity to not just take care of the idea of community, but to take care of all of the people who make up that community like that. Well, nowadays those people are in jail. Yeah. <laughs> and they're yeah. telling their stories in jail, those yeah. griots, griots and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. They're incarcerated. <laughs> or homeless. Or yeah. homeless, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I don't know how long we've been going, because we get going and we stop. But I know we want questions. We, the sure. other people yeah. have questions, too. Yeah. So. First of all, let's give it up. So, oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. I have a doctor's appointment at 5.30. I have to leave at 5. But um, if I could, this is just great. You guys bring back so many memories. It's so exciting. So I have a- You were in Virginia, right? West Virginia. West Virginia. Yeah, halfway between Pittsburgh and Washington. Okay, okay. And it's a very odd area because it's 30 minutes from Pennsylvania. It's on the Maryland-West Virginia border. And it's about 45 minutes from Virginia. So it's a- Crazy kind near Harpers Ferry. Okay, okay. So it's a tri-state area, right, right? right? So it's very, and my family's lived there for 200 years right. on all sides of my family. Right, right. It's a, such a counterintuitive black experience. It's, it's the Allegheny Mountains on the Tommy River. It's a country it, Negro. It was in the mountains, right? Yeah, totally. I'm a country boy. Right. I grew up fishing and hunting, and first day of deer season was a holiday. <laughs> you get a 410 when you're 12, you know, shoot rabbits and squirrels and eat them. Oh, yeah. That was my... That's how I grew up, and I love to fish still. I don't like to shoot things, but I like to fish. So anyway, you are, there's a bit of romanticization <clears throat> going on here about the good old days <laughs> of the CPO colored world, which I know um, from, you know, the, the Gateses were very fair complexion and very um, up, upper class within the black community, right? So I know the forms of intraracial discrimination and classification, as it were, within the race. It wasn't like one big party. Black people had, Freud called nationalism the narcissism of tiny differences. And we had the narcissism of tiny differences. But my God, as you know, my, you would just, by your phenotype, you, you would have done that. And that we, you mentioned the Brown Bag Society, right? And we had all kind of 
other structures. So in some ways, the black community was open and closed at the same time. So all this stuff about the doctors being there and role models, that part's true. But whether they would welcome Mr. In, into their house, I doubt it, right? Not, not, in my, not in my neighborhood, that wouldn't have happened. You could see them, though. You could see them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, and William Julius Wilson, our colleague who just retired, wrote a book about when work disappears and role models moving on. I'm with you on that. But I don't want any of our students to think that it was one big happy family oh, no. within the, the South oh, or, the, oh, no. or in Chicago. I mean, because we had class distinctions on top of class distinctions. Oh, yeah. we, oh, had, no. we had caste and color and all kind we of crazy. Caste. We had a whole caste system. Look, the first, I went to Yale 69. It was the first large group of black kids, 96, which was like Harlem, of Africa, as far as Yale was concerned, right? Yeah, it was amazing. So we had, we called it spook weekends, you know, like all black par party. Well, it wasn't even a question of whether it was all black, but that's just what we called spook weekend. And we would, we beat up on Yale to try to get them to serve soul food and stuff, starting to burn down the library, and so they would do it. The first two weekends, Cornell, the brothers from New Orleans, because Yale admissions are concentrated on New York, of course, New Orleans and LA. Being from West Virginia, I was a total outlier, but. The guys from New Orleans put up a paper bag. I had never even heard of a, a bag party. Put up a paper bag, so you couldn't get in. So you couldn't get in. And you matched that paper Yeah, well, I, we tore that shit down, yeah, yeah. you know? <laughs> we, but we that said, was real, though. Yeah, but we set them down and go, we don't know what sickness you guys came out of, <laughs> but this is over. You know, we're the Pan-African people. We had Afros, the Dashikis, you know, we were uh, black as beautiful. But I'm uh, the reason this is on my mind, Fred, is that I really want to do, I mean, God willing, um, something on a series on the segregate the sepia world, the segregated world, because many of our students think they have a simplistic notion um, about the Great Migration and everybody just left the South. People who were doing well didn't leave the South by and large, right? Right. The only reason Martin Luther King ever left the South was coming to Boston to get a PhD. He came from Black Church royalty, right? Vernon George left the South to integrate DePaul, and then come back. You know, they, there were old, wealthy entrepreneurs, undertakers, doctors, dentists, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, and it, it's a rich, Insurance complicated insurance. culture. And in, when Gunnar Myrdal uh, published An American Dilemma, Fred, he said that there would be a civil rights movement, but it would never break out in the South. And 11 years later, it did. You know, which I find interesting, that somehow the complex social structures of the people who didn't migrate, and many of those were very extremely well-educated people with, you know, deep pedigrees, that culture, somehow we don't know enough about it. You know, somehow there's a simplistic idea, everybody went to Harlem, there was a Harlem Renaissance, and thank God, no, it's, it's a lot more complicated than that. And I think... Um, so it's just one observation that I find fascinating about the, the, the segregated world. I love your title, The Segregated South and the Segregated North, um, because that's really what I would like to film, you know, about... The thing about Chicago, it was the biggest segregated city in the North. Yeah, Bronzeville. You could go, you could go 30 blocks in either direction, never see a white face. Mm -hmm. You couldn't do that in the South. Right. You know, your milkman, your policeman, everybody was white. Oh, that's true, yeah. The, um, so my question, just to both of you, I was watching Ken Burns' country music last night. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Because I always study Ken as a filmmaker, and he's a friend of mine, and he always puts um, our man Winton in there. He was trying to save country music, showed it had some kind of black, <laughs> and it had <laughs> basically had one scene of Ku Klux Klan members I'm and right. the Confederate gallery at the Grand Ole Opry. But he was talking about the importance of the radio. And you all started off talking about the radio. And I saw, um, is it Mavis Staples, in an interview recently. And she was talking about what we called Randy's Record Shop from Gallatin, Tennessee. I don't know if you got that John in R. Chicago. John R. Yeah. John R. J.R., yeah. yeah. John, R. John R. Yeah, yeah. You could get it all, all the way to the Mississippi River. You, yeah. You could and get it in. Up and we, down. We, but we could only get it at night at because night. WWVA. At 
it was 50,000 nice. watts. That was a, one of the country's biggest right. country music. Right, it right, was right. right up like an hour, two hours of my house. John, but at night, at, at, all night long. And at, all night long. So I'm interested, Fred, in the, the cross pollinating nature of radio in terms of cementing a black culture and Cornell, the army. My father used to talk about how much he learned about black culture by going into the army because the army was a pan African subunit, you know, of the American military government, meaning they had segregated, you know, he's in World War II. He was there with Charles Davis, whom you knew, Tony Davis's father, who was my mentor at Yale. And he and my father were in the same regiment or battalion or whatever in Camp Lee, Virginia, because all the black men were put in, before the Tuskegee Airmen and stuff, those exceptions were put in quartermaster camps to learn how to be. Charles was the valet to the general, yeah, and my father was right. in the kitchen, you know? <laughs> right. But he, he said that, you know, he, the first time he heard the signifying monkey was in, in the army, and black people playing the blues. Playing the blues and, and, and yeah, and, and the first time he ever heard someone say, rat now, instead of right, or, um, you know, other, other linguistic things. So I'm sort of interesting, interested in, if you've ever thought about those ways that black culture crossed, and one was electronic or radio, whatever you call it. The other is through physical structures like the army, the great migration, of course. The ways that the culture grew and morphed, and um, again, cross-pollinated um, its different segments. And finally, in terms of format, have you ever thought about larger format cameras? Like oh, I shoot, I shoot eight by 10. Eight by 10? Yeah, but usually 10. you shoot 35 millimeter, right? No, 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 I shoot middle, I shoot every four by five, six, seven, six, four, five. So what's your favorite? It depends on what, what, what you're trying, trying to, to do. To convey, yeah. So with digital, it used to be that if you anything was moving, it was hard to capture that without blurring with, with film. With film. But now do you mean you can use large format things digitally and it works better? Not so much large format. Digitally, you have to have a, a computer next to it to handle the, the pixels. Oh, that's good. I'm going to come back at dinner. I want you to tell me about that. Okay, but anyway, okay, okay, okay. Um, you guys want to come? I know it was kind of a speech, but you got to respond. <laughs> well, I mean... I'm I'm happy to be to be uh to be called romantic about about black community. So I'm I'm a I have a romance with it. I, I'm I'm a romanticist with regard to it. In in you know what I would hope at least is that I don't know some kind of Blakeian revolutionary romanticism with regard to it. And what I feel justifies my romance with the idea and the actuality of black community is um, is the brutality that has generally awaited us when we left it. So, so I'm romantic about it in a comparativist sense. <laughs> you know, yeah. um, but why it's, would you think we left? It? Well, but I do think that 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 many people have left it, and I don't even talk about that as if I'm talking about somebody else. I talk about it with regard to myself, and it's a very specific kind of the the great theologian Ruby Sales. I heard her on a podcast talking about this uh, some months ago. She talks about what happens when. And you know, I'm I'm kind of unabashed and unashamed about the relatively about what some folks might call the uncritical use of the pronoun we. I still like to use it, so I'm I'm going to use it. <laughs> um, but 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 how we send our children into places which we have. There's a beautiful song that I love by Gail Scott Heron called "Back Home." And in that song, you know. Uh, they told us that the streets were paved with gold. He's from Jackson, Tennessee. Uh, but that was just another story they told, right? That this, so it's, it's not a romanticism at all about, 
about the Great Migration. It's, uh, uh, it has nothing to do particularly with the specific geographical place of, the, of, the, of what Spillers calls the natal community. And the, the more you think about it, the more complicated it gets. It's our natal communities are not so much about being in a place as they are about this continual history of displacement. And yet somehow we form community in displacement anyway, mm -hmm. right? And often we form community in displacement not because we have some easy access to our natality, but because the natal occasion is constantly deferred for us. We, you know, we, don't, we don't have access to that. And nevertheless, community emerges. And so the question is not how to preserve it as some pristine place where there was no conflict, because it, on the one hand, one has to continually say, as you did, that there was conflict. And then there's another equally important way in which it goes without saying that there must have been. So we know that. We know that there was conflict. We know that there was internal differentiation. We know that there was caste differences and class differences. And, and, and we, we study those differences and we try to understand them with, with all, of, all of our might. Nevertheless, it still seems to me necessary to maintain a romance with that community precisely because what it is that we enter into when we leave that community is not a paradise but a zone of brutality. And when we send, as Ruby Sales says, when we send our children unarmored into these places that are conceived of as if they were utopian spaces, we, we do a disservice to them and we also do a disservice to at least what I would understand to be our historical mission. Right? Oh, I, I would yeah. absolutely agree yeah. with, with that point. Mm -hmm. Professor Lex? No, I think that you all actually are agreeing, but I want to salute Brother Frank Stewart for your magnificent Corn. artistry, though, brother. All right, go on. Very, very much so. And uh, Good to see you, brother. Anytime I get a chance to see Brother Fred Moten, I just come running, because uh, he always got something to say that's so rich, <laughs> <laughs> so deep. But it seems to me, you see, there's a difference between mature romance and immature romance. That's true. Yeah. You see, yeah. I'm going to die in love with Curtis Mayfield. Sure. You see what I mean? because he's an exemplar of courage, vision, of creativity, intelligence, and he's soulful. He's canonic. He empties himself, and his soul touches your soul. That's what it is at the highest levels of black art, what it means to empty yourself, donate yourself, give yourself what has gone into you historically, and communicate that genuinely. So mature romance is just being in love with great exemplars and exemplary figures like your the brother who, who, who cut your lawn. Mm -hmm. His creativity, his integrity, that's something that ought to be part of our lives for the rest of his afterlife. Absolutely. Forever. Mm -hmm. But immature is just sentimental mm -hmm. connection and affiliation that's not critical mm -hmm. and usually valorizes just one side of yourself because you don't want to come to terms with the darkness inside of you. That's true. So all you want is just light, 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 light. Well, no, you got to grow up. Life ain't like that. You a gangster too, mother hucker. You see what I mean? <laughs> so you think they're gangster? You a gangster too. Just check yourself. And that, if you listen to Curtis Mayfield enough, he gonna tell you that. So is Aretha. So is Billie Holiday. So is all the great with Duke and so forth and so on. But I think but part of Fred's question is, is what happens when you try to transmit this in face of the overwhelming market? The market ain't about falling in love with greatness. It's about getting over with success. It's about making it. It's not about keeping faith. It's about access to spectacle and image and status. It's not about substance, sacrifice, service, and kenosis. <laughs> giving yourself. But that's reflected in new forms of black culture. Absolutely. But, but part, of the, part of the creativity and the genius of black people is, even in the face of the market, the elements of the best of our culture still comes through. You just got to keep track of it among these young brothers and sisters. Sometimes even unconscious of it. In the prison, on the block, as well as in middle class places, but less and less in middle class places because they have access to the status and spectacle and image and they really think that they ought to be successful and they, rather than great. And they don't have the knowledge of the tradition. And it was well, not just knowledge, they haven't cultivated and chosen 
a knowledge of the tradition. Because you don't get tradition on the block by osmosis either. You got to tend to it. Sure. You got to cultivate it. We learn that from Martin Tilson. We learn it from old, see what I mean? So in that sense, there is a real overlap. Is that, is that a fair characterization of it? Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. we, 50 years later, created, not we didn't create them, but we're propagating institutions. Absolutely. To do exactly what you're saying. That's right, to that's right. Set them up, mentalize it, romanticize it, romanticize it but criticize it. Critically filter. The most sophisticated. The uh, whole, absolutely. My dream is that every person of color, my dream is that every student would have to take an introduction to African American studies, but God knows that every black person would have to take a black history course. Or black music course, but you know, like if, if the only place you can learn about black culture is Harvard, if this is where your background is, then for Christ's sake, take the course. But you got to have that knowledge, or you're going to be crushed. Oh, absolutely. Anyway, I got to go. Down. I'm going to join y'all. Keep arguing. We're going to go to Benedetto later. I hope you join us. Y'all gonna have cognac and things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See you later. Okay, 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 bro. Be well, little brother. Okay, I'll see you later. All right. Well. And I count myself amongst them. The old man have spoken. So uh, one more. <laughs> and then, then we, we, we should hear from some other folks, too. <laughs> I, was, I was kind of figuring you was running right along by, right behind me, at least. So. Too old to operate this mic, so. I want to try to state this more briefly than the example that was uh, set. Uh, your question was, you, you put some really great thoughts into my mind, both of you. Uh, Fred, I, I'm thinking about this, this, this etymological thing you do with the uh, improvisation. Um, when, I, when, I, when I teach uh, uh, jazz, uh, uh, I, I ask my students, what's improvisation? And they throw up their hands and they say stuff like, making stuff up on the spot. And then... Uh, my counterexample is the movie uh, Castaway with Tom Hanks, right? When he gets off the island, is it does he use in prior knowledge or is he making shit up on the spot? Did he does he roll some boulders out and make a raft out of them, or does he know about flotate? Right. So <laughs> we jazz musicians know it's about preparation. It's about uh, you know learn it, then forget it, and then play it. Um, but. <sighs> Whoa, this is a word that's at the heart of jazz studies, improvisation. And now you've, you've, you've hit me to the idea that it's, a, it's an enemy lurking. It's a, a subversive thing. And then when I think about improvisation being applied to jazz, it was applied by people who were like saying these Negroes were making this stuff up <laughs> on the spot. Mm -hmm. These are the same people who were saying <coughs> when James Reese Europe went over, uh, these guys are playing trick instruments. Yeah, right. Uh, right? So there's a, there's a whole subtext under that. So the question I'm asking, and I got there in record time, is uh, what do we do with these, what do you suggest that, that we uh, youngins do with these words? Uh, you know, how careful do we have to be about language uh, and these words that are, you know, at the heart of our, our, our the sh supposed shared values of the language that we're talking about, improvisation, soul, uh, uh, blues. Uh, yeah, uh, how do we approach these, uh, this linguistic minefield? Greg, Greg Thomas, you got something to say about that, bro? He writes about yeah. jazz all the time. I don't know if I'm the right one to answer this question with these esteemed gentlemen here and Professor West. Um, but what was going through my mind as you asked the question was the linguistic is only going to give you an approximation of what the actual emotional experience is. For, to a certain extent, the, the art form or the creation of the art is going to be an expression of feelings and form, as Su Suzanne Langer put it. And it's, and it's coming from a cultural matrix or milieu. Yeah, it's a right, right. So, but <laughs> language is what we have. Language is a vehicle of culture. So... We have to work with it. Now, 
What I also thought of is this is why my man here, my professor at NYU 20 years ago, poetry. Because poetry is using language in a way that's very musical. Okay? So it's not about a denotative firm set meaning because meaning changes over time. And the way you use certain words will, all, will change over time the inflection and the emphasis. So you know that's gonna happen, but when you get to poetry, and that's why I'm bringing it up, because I wanna hand the mic <laughs> back to Professor Moten to let him answer this question and perhaps bring in poetry into this. Well, the, the thing about, um, the reason why uh, the, the, the Benjamin essay seems so crucial to me is because it's not just that you're looking back, um, but, but you're looking back into the wreck of history, right? Um, and I realized that so much of what seems to me really vital in contemporary poetry, um, which is to say in contemporary black poetry, is going through this this complex movement of moving forward while looking back. Um, that seems to me to be what's going on in, um, in Norbessi Phillips' poetry and in Nathaniel Mackey's poetry. Yeah. And there's moments in Mackey where you can see the echo of, you know, the trace of his own reading of Benjamin, like early on in Bedouin Horn book where he talks about a, a line stretching back to Abidjan, a, a, a bridge, you know, this. So some of it is, is obviously a, a movement backwards that we could, it's a transcontinental movement, but it could be that movement back that, that we were doing, you know, thinking about Arkansas, thinking about Memphis. But it's, it's not, uh, I don't think of it as, a, as an immature romantic nostalgia in part because what you're looking back to was always itself provisional. It was always just the place where the refuge of an ongoing displacement, right? And so the thing about improvisation is I don't want to, but we look back to that word too. I don't want to give that word up. Right. But what I was looking back to was my own earlier uses of it. And, and I think misuses of it, you know? Um, and I'm, I'm, so I, I'm fascinated by the fact that probably between 1959 and 1968, Miles must have played, so what, 275 nights a year. That's an ongoing practice of revision. And it's, and it's a practice of revision there's certainly forward movement in the development of his relation to so what? It just gets faster, right? Like 59 is, you know, loping, you know, by, yeah, right on the plug nickels, like, you know, it's this pointillistic thing, right? So, so what he's doing is he's saying, you know, he's looking back critically at the history of his own commitment to that, to that piece, right? And we have to look back critically at the history of our commitment to the term improvisation. And, and interestingly, improvisation as a word, its meaning actually, I think, bears that very process of, of, of looking back. So, so I don't, I heard, I, another thing I heard with Dada say, he, we were <laughs> in Glasgow, he was playing solo. And he, and, it, and he got through playing and he said, man, it, sometimes it just hurts to play this music. Mm. It hurts to play it. And I heard at that same event, Norbessie Phillip talk about how much it hurt her to have to dive back into the ocean, to dive into the water to recover those voices that she recovers in song, mm. right? Mm. So, you know, like when, when Mahesh said, my soul looks back and, and you look back at what you went through, but that looking back also hurts 
It's not easy. It, it, it is a difficult process of criticism. But I'm romantic about black culture precisely to the extent that it has been a place. I'm not saying it's unique in American culture, but it's one of the few places in American culture which has been willing to do that work, which has been willing to look back at the wreck, OK, in the interest of moving forward. So so this is, you know, that's what that's what I'm. That's what I'm thinking about the term, you know, it, not to give it up, can't give it up, but we gotta keep pressing on it. We gotta keep working it, gotta keep worrying it, you know. Improving so, it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, anybody? Yeah, yeah so uh, this has just been so beautiful to experience. Um, so I'm Brittany Mache, I'm a visiting fellow here, and I'm trained as a geographer. So Fred, I wanted to ask you a question about the placement of the natal community. So mm -hmm. I want to retain something of the physicality of the Mississippi Delta. I want to retain something of the Gulf Coast. I want to retain something specific about sort of the South as a kind of imaginative place. Mm -hmm. So. And the reason I'm asking this is because there's a kind of generation of black millennials who are like, we need to go back, right? We're gonna go back to that place that our sort of grandparents came from. Mm -hmm. And I guess how do we kind of square both the not falling into the romanticism of going back to a place that um, may not exist anymore, yeah. but yeah. also that there's something there, right? I, I take what um, Skip said about like some people didn't leave, and so what, what are our kind of ethical commitments to the folks who didn't leave? But can we also talk about a kind of new South that offers something sort of substantive? Um, and I'll kind of say, Frank, your voice reminds me so much of my grandmother, uh -oh. but my mother doesn't sound like that, uh -huh. and I don't sound like that, right? And so I'm, I'm wondering sort of what gets lost in that kind of generational passage and to sort of going back offer some kind of reckoning with what we've lost. The thing about when I was growing up, you knew a black person by the way they talked. You know, you could hear it over the phone. Now you don't, you know, you don't know who's black or white. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you, know you, you could tell by the way they walked that they were black, you know. We've lost some of that in the transition of the new urban environment. So, I mean, I don't, I don't know the answer to going back. You know, I go back all the time, and it's different. It's not the same place. I go back to Memphis, and my house is gone. You know, the crackheads uh, tore my house up <laughs> that I lived in. That, that was the vortex of my whole existence at one time, you know? That's gone. Yeah, I, I had to get them out of my grandma's house that I lived in when I graduated from high school. Crackhead, man, you know. And, and we ain't talking about Memphis. Kings and Arkansas had 303 <laughs> right, people right. in it. And the crackheads were still there. I mean, so, so you know. it's like, man, you know, um, I feel it. I hear what you're saying. I do. And I, it's funny because um, I always think about these questions in relation to this beautiful poem that Baraka wrote in the late 60s called Return of the Native. Mm -hmm. And um, it starts off. Harlem is vicious modernism, bang clash, and bang clash is one word. And so in one way, it's a poem about something that he figures as a return, which is his movement from Greenwich Village and from a certain kind of, you know, bohemian, you know, white artistic lifestyle that he left, you know, when Malcolm X was killed and left his family, you know, his children, his wife to move up to Harlem and start the Black Arts Repertory Theater. But the trick of it, of course, is that he wasn't from Harlem. He was from Newark. <laughs> <laughs> and he went back to Newark. He eventually did go back to Newark. Back to Newark. Yeah. But, but there's always this. And he says something. He, 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 there's a line in it where he talks about the place and the placement of black people. But he spells placement P-L-A-C-E slash M-E-A-N-T. He, he, he puts that A, the trace of meaning, of the making of meaning, in, is put in place, is put in proximity to place. It, on the one hand, and I know I feel scared talking to you, geographer, because y'all are very rightly picky about the distinction between 
between place and space, right? And, and place has, I think, is supposed to have a more concrete social sort of aspect to it. But that concrete sociality is also bound up with meaning. It's also bound up with how people make meaning out of a place. How, and, but if the place is then, I don't want to say submitted, but if it is solicited, it, it, the, what if the place, is, it, the place is literally moved by the meaning that we make of it and the meaning that we put into it? And that's what creates that kind of weird both sad but sometimes maybe exhilarating situation where you go home and you're home but it's not home. You go home but the home ain't there. I, I go to Las Vegas where I grew up and I get lost. Mm. You know, and I go to Kingsland to, to my grandma's house and this is the weird thing, right? Like I, I try to tell my kids stories. I can see right across from my grandmother's house is Miss Maddie's house. And then right up the street from Miss Maddie was Miss B.C. And Miss B.C. lived next to her sister, Miss Fanny. And across the street from Miss Fanny was my cousin, Mabel. All those folks are gone when I go. But I see them. I hear them. And deeper still, I, hear, I can see Aunt Bet and Aunt Laura, okay, who was my, my great aunt. My, my, grand, my grandmother was raised by her, hus by her uncle's wife who my grandma who my mom called Big Mom Berta. That's who my mother was named after. I can see Big Mom Berta. I can see her mother, Aunt Laura. It's just that Big Mom Berta died in 1952 and I was born in 1962. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? This mm -hmm. but because place is infused with those people. I can see them walking down the street. I can hear them. I because of those stories, because of the meaning that was made and, and so I feel like it's not about, you can't go back to, you go back there and it's gone and they're not there. And so the place isn't there, but then you have to make a new place. So you make a new place. And that's what I think Barack is trying to say, that, that the return is, is in a way not a return. But, it, but, but you go back and you gotta make us, we gotta make something new, which is what we've always had to do. <laughs> um, and I, I think about going back myself sometimes, you know. Um, yeah. So. Well, I go back all the time. I mean, I think about going back to state. Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah. I go back all the time. Thank you all so much. Really enjoying this conversation. Uh, I'm from Montgomery, Alabama. And, yeah, Montgomery, <laughs> Alabama, and I went to uh, undergrad at Fisk University in Nashville. Okay, okay. And I moved here for graduate school from Detroit. So I'm pretty, I'm also kind of a, an unapologetic romanticist, hopefully a mature romanticist. <laughs> but uh, uh, my question is uh, twofold. One, uh, Mr. Stewart, I'd love to hear more about your relationship to Fisk University uh, in Nashville. Um, secondly, uh, for both of you, but particularly you, Mr. Stewart, as an athlete, um, I'm interested in what it feels like to get in the zone. I grew up playing basketball, have the experience of being in the zone as, you know, when on the court and when playing. And I'm interested in what it might feel like as a photographer to be in the zone. It's the same um, thing. It's the same thing. And also as a poet, even. And how do you even cultivate that space to get in the zone? You know, I know practice, I'm sure, is a part of it. And, you know, becoming used to your craft and your tools of the craft, but just would love to hear you both maybe speak about being in the zone and again also about your well, relationship as, to Fisk. As you know, are you, you Santera, Santera too? Yes, sir. Okay, so as you know, when, you, when, you, when you're an athlete, it's all inside, you know? You're fighting the elements of outside coming in to make you weak or get you tired or, you know, you, you're constantly fighting. The art form is like that too. You know, you're constantly fighting to improve what you already are doing. So when I went to Middleton C State, I ran track and played basketball. But it was a white school that was integrate, integrating into having some black students. And we were all either on an athletic or academic scholarship. So I would go to, I would finish my practice every day and go up to Fisk and audit 
David Driscoll's classes. And Bobby since that, you know David Driscoll? Yes. You know who he is? So I would audit his classes every day. Just to get, you know, my dose of blackness. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I came from blackness, but you know, I didn't have blackness like that. It was a different kind of blackness. <laughs> so <laughs> I mean that was my my relationship to this. Yeah, the, the athletic thing is, I think it's pretty deep, actually. I mean, I, you know, I played football here when I was an undergrad, um, my, my fresh, first year. And um, I would have kept playing except for some. <laughs> but I would go to football practice. <laughs> and um, I would go to football practice, take my shower, go eat dinner. And then head down to Packer Manse in Roxbury with Eugene Rivers and this beautiful saintly woman named Sarah Small. And that was my freshman year. It didn't include going to class was the problem. <laughs> so I, I had to go home for a year and rethink everything. But, 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 but I remember, I know something, I don't, I haven't thought about it in relation to poetry, but I, the person who I really want to ask about is, is Nate, Nate Mackey, you know, who was a pole vaulter at Princeton and a football player. And, you know, it, I feel like there's something about, well, something, it's kind of like that thing I, that I, I think it's true, I think it happened, that I heard, you know, that Ellington said that he, be very, very low to have anybody in his band who couldn't dance, mm. right? That the capacity to play the music had to do with this kind of proprioceptive thing that, you know, you had to be able to move, you know, that, you know, and, and I feel like maybe art in general, you know, it requires that some kind of a relation to, 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 to movement. You know, um, and obviously that's clear in dance, but I think it's, so I don't, I don't, it doesn't mean that you, you have to play a sport, but you do have to move. You have to move to make art, it seems to me, um, which is particularly important to remember now that so much of school is just making kids sit still, you know, and, and it's a form of, it's a brutal form of, of regulation that, you know, just destroys kids. It destroys kids. And um, so, yeah, I, I think that, because, yeah, I mean, that that zone that you talk about, I, yeah, it's a, we could talk about it in terms of trance, or you, can, you know, you're right, it's, it's a kind of heightened concentration. Stuff's, you're going faster, but it feels slower, you know, kind of. Yeah. Or you, you hit somebody so hard you don't feel it. Or something like that, you know, it's cut, like that, you know, when you hit a baseball really hard, you don't feel it. It's like no recoil, <laughs> you know, kind of. So I think all of those things are are part part of part of it. But it seems to me that it all means it. That I, mean, I just love watch those uh, films of Pollock painting, hmm. right? You know, Jackson Pollock painting. You know, where you could see he was his. The movements of his body were c clearly, you know, written, so to speak, onto the canvas, and that was, that's that was a learning thing for me. You know, you can see see that. Um, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think we have time for one more question if someone wants to close this out. Okay. okay. Um, hi, my name is Salma. I'm I'm a senior at the college right now. Um, I'm grateful for a lot of the discussion around the sort of like impossibility of a lot of these questions. Um, it's something that I've been grappling a lot with um, these past couple of <laughs> weeks, uh, especially as I move into writing a creative thesis. Um, and I'm sort of intrigued by the question of method versus practice um, when it comes to the philosophy of science. Um, and have been thinking about how to apply that also to art making, but also living. Um, I think that something that I find very beautiful about art making is that it is a, an attempt to represent living 
but living is never complete. It is a constantly static and uh, constantly moving. And, um, you know, you can never really achieve full soulfulness. Um, but what I'm struggling with now is this sense of sort of teetering on nihilism um, because of the sort of impossibility of achieving soulfulness and the impossibility then of representing it. Um, and I guess this is the question that you've been asking Professor Moten all night, is like how, how do we sort of grasp at something that is impossible? Um, and what does the process of maintaining a sort of hope look like? Mm -hmm. In, in this work and like what does it look like on the concrete level? Um, because you know I'm it, like what are the day-to-day -day things that we can do to attempt to grasp the impossible? Um, yeah. <laughs> well I feel like the reason maybe this is strictly the difficulty of the question is strictly a function of that I didn't ask Frank the right question. I forgot to ask him one question. Um, I don't think it's, if you think it's impossible, if, 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 if it seems like it's impossible or if it seemed like I was saying it, it's impossible to grasp this. What I, what I meant to say was, I don't think you can do it by yourself. <laughs> but, but you can, so, so I was going to ask you about Kamawinge. Am I Kamu pronouncing it Kamu right? Kamawinge, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which is a Kikuyu word that means what? A group of people doing something together. Together, right. Okay. And it was this great. As one. Well, you say something about it. Uh, Roy was the first director of it, Roy DiCarago. So that's why I wanted to get into it because he was in it and it was just a lot of other thinkers in there as well. Uh, it was a group of black photographers that formed older, in older the early cats. 60s. Yeah, yeah. Right. early 60s. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there was, there was no place you could go learn how to take pictures if you didn't go to some college somewhere. And they weren't letting a whole lot of black folks in these colleges that had photography programs. Mm -hmm. So we could go to this collective and you could learn all kind of, you know, I, I got just volumes of information from them. Mm -hmm. And we did a book too, we did a few yeah. books. What about Kamoinga? Well, the, the point that I was thinking about is just, cause I, it's this beautiful right, you book can't do called it, Timeless. Yeah, you, right? can't, you can't do it yourself. You can't. You need help you with need it. <laughs> you, know, you need help with, with sports, you know. Yeah. To get better, yeah. you gotta be better than the next guy. You gotta try mm -hmm. to be better than somebody that's already better than you. You know, that's why you look at the masters when you're painting or taking pictures. You you wanna log that so when you see it, you can use it. So even when you think you're by yourself, you're not by yourself. But 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 that kind of. communal experience which on the surface appears to be a solo experience as rich as that can be as rich as it is to listen to all the voices in your head it's even better to listen to the voices coming from your friends who are with you so and you know school they try to make you do everything by yourself you know they make you sit still and they make you be by yourself so so, so don't do that. <laughs> that could not have been a better ending to this conversation. So thank you so much for being with us today. Thank all of you. And please join us outside the Hip Hop Archive for a reception, some room refreshments, and thank our guests, please, for being here.